This is a featuring people who are going to untold stories touching the human and personal side of our people in politics, religion, sports, business, music, culture, the media, and more. Getting to know our farmers, our public servants, youth, and the ordinary Dominican. Listen to their stories. No limitations, no restrictions, no holds bar. In the spotlight, we we'll also spotlight interesting topics, issues, and relevant situations. Don't miss In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. In the Spotlight. Spotlight Radio Show on Q95 with yours truly, Fadina Frampton. I know I don't normally say my name at the beginning of the show. I shouldn't always presume that everyone who's listening knows who I am. Somebody could be listening for the first time, probably just caught the live on social media and decided to stick around and probably wondering, 
Who was that young lady? What show is that? <laughs> All right, good evening everyone once again. Thank you for joining us for tonight's In the Spotlight radio show. Hello, Shelly Ann. This is the name I'm seeing as one of the viewers on the live. Noreen, good evening to you. As they're coming up at the beginning, we can just say a few hellos, hi, hellos. But we are here again for another program, a program that you love, you absolutely love on a Monday night. Uh, this show has quite a bit of fans, fans from everywhere, here, right here in Dominica, in the Caribbean, in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, you know, all around the world, we have somebody, I saw somebody um, logged in the other day and said they were logging in from New Zealand. So wherever you are tuned into the program, we are happy to have you. I think what it is about this program that captivate, captivates and, and, you know, draws on people is the fact that it is primarily human interest. Um, it's about people and their stories. And the thing about this program is that almost everyone that we bring here leaves at least one listener empowered, inspired, motivated, enlightened, happy, maybe sad sometimes, but the point is that, you know, the fact that we're dealing with um, human beings and their stories is what's um, attractive to the fans and the listeners of this program. And I'm happy to be here on a Monday night to be able to do that, to be able to bring you those stories, to be able to bring those folks live in the studios and to be able um, to allow them to share those stories. Now, when we do the program, as I've always said, it's primarily a radio program. So we are live on Q95 FM, and we thank Mr. Gregoire and his team for facilitating us and accommodating us here on a Monday night. And we really do appreciate it. And we also go live on, um, on my Facebook page, and the other pages but it's not no big production like i've said to people um folks have have told me you know you need to get the program on youtube um you need to probably get one of the streaming um thingies to stream your show and all of that i mean at some point you know a few people have offered to assist and you know i'm grateful for 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 their offer and i will i definitely will and i've had a few folks in the diaspora as well reach out to me and say, Fadines, you know, we may be over there, we cannot be in Dominica, <laughs> um, live in the studios, we know that is how you do your show, but there's a few of us who are out there who would really like to share our stories. So I'm giving it some thought, and probably I may do something separate and apart, probably an in the spot like that for a version, and probably just do it on, on social media only, but I will find a way around it, and I will definitely find a way uh, to make it work, so we can actually hear um, from from some of you who are interested in, in being spotlighted and I've said to you do not feel ashamed do not feel any way in inboxing me sending me a message and well my guest didn't do that tonight mm -hmm. but I'm saying there's nothing wrong you know in just sending me a message and say for that I think you know I could be a good guest for your program I would welcome that because I do not know everyone you know today somebody gave me a, the brilliant suggestion of a fisher woman and I'm looking forward to having her sometime in April, you know. So feel free to suggest, feel free to recommend. And if you feel you're, you, you're worthy of being a guest on the program, then why not? Once you can come here, give us some inspiration, enlighten us a bit, you know, um, we would be very, very, very happy um, to have you on the program. So let's again acknowledge Josephine Gabriel and Company Limited. They provide us with our topic of water. And we thank them for that. And also, Barefoot Wine. So tonight, my guest is getting his um, Barefoot Wine from Josephine Gabriel and Company Limited. It's Barefoot Fruits Cattle. And just to give them a little plug here, it says, these deliciously sweet blends are made with wine and natural flavors, burst with aromas of juicy, refreshing watermelon, crisp, juicy apples, 
sun-kissed strawberries and perfectly ripe peaches and they're available at all supermarkets and retail outlets highland white so carlton this is for you you can show the your, your viewers that um this bottle of wine you i think you've got what version what 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 flavor do you have it's um apple it's apple awesome so this is for carlton we want to thank as well dpex so dpex thank you we want to thank uh, Jordan Jerome who supports us with ensuring that our logo is on our video. Parking Low, um, I mean this young man is just fabulous, he's amazing. Thank you Akim and of course you the listeners and the fans of the program, um, thank you for, for, for supporting us. Um, we have all platforms, the In The Spotlight Radio Show. Uh, we have that page and that page also has a group so there's a group by the in the spotlight radio show um, of course there's my page for Diana Frampton you can follow me um, there's my public page for Diana Fernanda Frampton I'm on Instagram for Diana Frampton as well and also I would like you to uh, support our triple effort marketing and advertising page so please patronize uh, our pages um, there's something, there's a request I have to make tonight. I hope I have enough people on the live. Let me see who's going to come through for me. So, guys, I'm not going to be afraid to ask, of, ask this of you. My tripod, one of the nights fell right here in the studios. It fell on the, on the, on the floor here. It's concrete. It's a concrete floor, and it broke. So, I'm actually, it's there tonight, but, you know, I, I'm hoping that it's going to, you know, take us through the program and other programs. So, somebody who is kind enough and generous, if you feel generous enough, please donate a tripod to the In The Spotlight Radio Show. We would greatly, greatly appreciate it. So we're coming back. Our guest tonight is my friend. His name is Carlton Lando. He's a pharmacist by profession, but he's a host of other things, including being a very good-hearted man. And we're coming back to talk to him in just a while. This is the In The Spotlight Radio Show right here on Q95. Thank you to our radio listeners, those of you who are listening to us online using whatever medium, and those of you who've already joined us on our Facebook Live, we thank you for joining us. Carlton is there already giving you a beautiful smile. So let's wave and say good evening um, to, to everyone and you in turn folks on the live. Just let us know that you're there. We're coming right back in just a few. Keep it locked. Ninety-five FM radio every Monday night from eight PM in the spotlight, featuring people from all walks of Dominican life, spotlighting their triumphs and tragedies, dreams, hopes, and aspirations, untold stories, touching the human and personal side of all people in politics, religion, sports, business, music, culture, the media, and more. Getting to know our farmers public servants, youth, the ordinary Dominican. Listen to their stories. No limitations, no restrictions, no holds barred. In the spotlight, we'll also spotlight interesting topics, issues, and relevant situations. Don't miss In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. everyone it is 20 minutes past the eight o'clock hour this is the in the spotlight radio show tonight our guest is a friend a friendly pharmacist too <laughs> and a warm individual whom I know is always willing to assist is supportive and definitely has a kind 
disposition. His name is Carlton Lango. And he is my guest. A pleasure to have you, Carlton. Good evening. Good evening to you, Fedaina, and to the many listeners and viewers at this time. I know that in your in the spotlight is a very it's almost a staple here in Dominica and so many fans um, listen to you each Monday. And including I, I, yourself. Including myself. I mean, last week uh, you had Dr. Valda Henry and I just could not, uh, you know, give up my phone. I, I, I went to show until the show ended. So it, it, the show really does have an impact. Yes, So it's, it's really a pleasure for me to be here this evening and I'm quite flattered that you asked me. I remember I was doing my own talk show when you sent me the message <laughs> and I was like, oh my. And I must confess that I gave Fedaina some trouble. Yes, I was did. I was really cold feet. I I, I, I felt oh Why uh, I don't know if I want to do this. Why? Why though? <laughs> uh, I just felt um, you know, I've listened to the show, um, the way it's chronicled and yes the contents are always good, but I guess the bare fact, you know, it's always when you when you do shows, I mean like you I, I do talk shows and mm -hmm. you know you ask the questions. Mm -hmm. Well, when it's on the reverse where somebody has to to uh, to ask you the questions, it always feels like a little nervy. So mm -hmm. that's I think that that's what may have been playing the part for me. But you you have a good story. <laughs> yes, and I do. I look forward to to definitely hearing your story um, tonight on the program. Most people know you as a pharmacist. And as you said, you host a radio program, so you're usually on the radio, yes. on probably every one of the radio stations, yes. hosting some segment or the other mm -hmm. um, for the company that you work for, yes. Jolly's Pharmacy. So you're somewhat of a household name um, at the moment. So people know you in that aspect. Yes. Yes. So they know the person who comes on the radio, who will tell them about their medication, who will tell them about new products, uh, that's a jolly's pharmacy. Yes. You will speak about particular particular diseases. Um, people will call you. They will ask you what should they do about this and what should they do about that and what medication should they take for this and so on and so forth. Um, but even for me, you know, I think I I I want to know more. Mm -hmm. I want to know more about Carlton. Um, and one of the first things that I want to know about you, Carlton, is <laughs> the confusion with your last name. <laughs> let's, talk, let's, let's, let's break the ice a little and talk about the confusion with your last name. I say Lando. Yes. There are some people who say Languidoc. Yes. Um, you say Lando. Yes. I've heard you say Lando. Yes. So the correct, I would presume, is Lando. Is there a correct or non-correct? They're both correct. What is the case with that? The, the, from... from English scholars, the pronunciation is Lando. Lando. Yes. Um, it is a French originated surname. Um, my grandfather came from Boetica. Um, from what I was told by my aunt, the ancestry came from Europe. Okay. So if you do, anybody who lives in France or would have gone to France, there is a, a, a community or a provenance, I think, it's, that is called Lando. And it's pronounced, it is spelled the same way as our surname is. However, but this surname has gone through several changes. <laughs> um, I was speaking to an aunt of mine who is in her 70s, and she was saying to me that um, they were using L A N D O initially. Oh. And then when their father had to get some documents, he realized that the surname was spelled L A N G U E D O C. And so they had to now drop the L A N D O and now convert to L A N G U E D O C. Right. Um, there are some people like me now. My surname has a some like all my documents has a Q. So it's not a G. It has a Q. So it's a kind of interchange. There are some Landos in Salisbury. I think the spell is L A N D O. Mm. Um, I think like now. But same right? family. It's the same. Yeah. Then you have L A N Q U E D O C. Then you have L-A-N-G-U-E-D-O-C. Wow. But it's the same family. It's the same, it's the same family. Yes. It's the same surname, just spelled differently and surname. pronounced differently. Right. Like my US visa has L-A-N-Q-U-E-D-O-C. My new passport has L-A-N-G-U-E-D-O-C. Um, but I'll tell you what. That's the, a problem. The, <laughs> the previous passports that I held before we moved to digital, 
it had L A N Q U E D O C all along. So what happened? So then with all the documents, when I brought, you know, I had to get all the documents. You present your passport. They go with what's in your passport. And then when we moved to um, digital uh, passports, they said to me I had to get my father's birth paper. And here my father had L A N G U E D O C. So it's what's on your birth paper? <laughs> on my birth paper currently has L A N G U E D O C. Has that gotten you problems at no, all? No, it hasn't. So it far, hasn't. because as I was saying, my but US wait, visa. But if you go back for your US visa, though, what what happens? Well, there? they will have to take what's now on the. But remember, the US visa, your pass, your your fingerprints are in the well, same. Yeah. That's it. So um, the. So, so currently, I would assume that when I do go to renew my passport, they will give the G. Okay. Yes. All right. Fair enough. But it's Lambda. But it's Lambda. Yes. And and how often do you have to say to people it's Lambda and um, language? In Dominica, most people know it's Lambda. When I travel, it's Lambda. When I I, I will talk a little about when I lived on St. Kitts, that is how I had to pronounce my surname, Lambda, Lam La because be nobody there. saw Lambda. No matter where I went, it was always confusions. Confusion because they just couldn't spell it. They, they, it, it was, they were pronounced in all different ways. So for the ten years I lived there, I had to say Languedoc. Okay. Yes. All right. So we had to start with that because you know I, I, I know I remember in in is it in our media chat group or something there was a whole discussion over that is it Languedoc is it Lando you know whatever the case is but um it's Lando yes. as far as you know but your spells with a Q yes. and not the G. Right. All right. All right, Carlton. So we've broken up the we've broken mm -hmm. the ice a little bit. Yes. <laughs> I know you have some some folks who are listening. Your wife, your children. Oh, yes. Yeah, my aunts, my mother. Uh, in Jimmy, Judah and Moses, my sister in Cochrane, Leah Moses, my wife here in, in Miro, and my aunt in St. Joseph. Yeah, I, I saw uh, Mr. Ted Sira who taught me in secondary school. So he's, I think he's a huge fan of yours. Yes, he's a constant so. <laughs> listener of so, uh, I think many people are listening. Yes, yes. and we welcome them. Definitely. We're very happy to have them, especially if you brought us a few new ones. Yes. We hope that they stick around and listen to future Definitely. programs, right? So, Carlton, you spoke a bit about um, your Auntie Maho and this one here and there. Yes. And in our promotional video, um, you mentioned that you will clarify where exactly it is that you're from. Now, we have to say, and I've said that to you before, that I thought you were from Cottage or Capuchin. <laughs> I cannot remember why I came to that conclusion at some point in time, but I thought you were from actually Cottage or Capuchin. And wow. then you said to me, no, <laughs> I am not. West so where, where do you come from? Tell us about your family heritage. Nice. Okay, my mother, who is um, Yudalan Moses, lives in Jimet, um, grew up in Maho. She's actually from Maho. My father is from St. Joseph. Mm. Um, from what I have seen as an adult now, it would seem that many men in St. Joseph had girlfriends in Maho. <laughs> <laughs> so many of us, uh, many people from Maho, they have family in St. Joseph now because I guess the community is so close. But um, when I was born in 1974, Oh my God, you're one of the few people who come here and very proudly say, when yeah. I was born in 1974. <laughs> Go well, on, Carlton. Yeah, when I was born in 1974, um, I, 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 I was with my mom for a little bit, and then afterwards I went to move uh, with my grandmother in St. Joseph. Um, so I may have been a few months old when my grandmother took me um, because not that my mother abandoned me nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, my mother you was, was a young that. yes. My mother was a young teenage person. Um, so your mom had you in her teenage. Uh, yes, my okay. father too. They okay. were both teenagers, and my mom felt at the moment she wasn't fully prepared financially to maybe care for me. And my grandmother and them were sort of better off, and so and so my my mother. Um, my grandmother took me. So I lived in St. Joseph for my very early years. I'm really enjoying the fond of St. Joseph. One of the, my, my fondest moments about St. Joseph is the Catholic bell. You know, that bell would ring consistently at six o'clock in the evening. And at that time, the sound of the bell, we knew at that time as children, we have to go and get bread for dinner. Uh, it was just, and St. Joseph was very, very 
active and you know everybody was even there was a today, vibes even today when they're on carnival time St. Joseph yes, is one of the yes, communities that yes. stands out right so we'll go and get the bread in the streets as they'll call it the street down by Miss um, Miss Edith Fig and shop and so forth my grandmother was a baker but we'll go get stuff um, to make dinner uh, so I had some real good time in St. Joseph and when I was five my mother took me back so my mother at that time was married and uh, um, I had a sister then, my mother's second child, and my mother was more stable, and I stayed with my mother in Maho at first. We lived in an area called Lao Picati, when it just coming into Maho, and then subsequently we moved to Jimit. So now, in terms of where I am, where I'm from, I would say that I'm originally, I'm from Jimit. Mm -hmm. Why? Because this is yeah. where I spent. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Yeah. We started talking about St. Saint Joseph, Joseph yes. and Maho. And Maho. Now, Jimmy? But in terms of quantification. Okay. I would say that. <laughs> is, that the... <laughs> wait, 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 is that how we decided? Yeah, that's how I'm deciding it. In terms of quantification and where I, I, I really, in a, term, in a sense, developed into a man, mm -hmm. I would say it, it would be Jimmy. It, it would be Jimmy. Because even I was still in primary school and leaving Jimmy. And commuting every day from St. Joseph to Jimmit and went to secondary school, still living in Jimmit, went to college, still living in Jimmit. So I would say Jimmit would be, because I, I remember very well um, before the housing scheme was built in Jimmit, the first housing scheme that was built by Dame Eugenia Charles' government. And I remember what was there at that time. Jimmit was a hamlet. And it was called Hat Hatford Estate. Okay. And I remember the very few houses were there, no electricity, no running water. I remember the, the very first standpipe we received um, from, it wasn't the Wasco at the time, it was called um, Central Water, for it is. Okay. Yeah. I remember going to the river uh, to fetch water uh, with your, how do you call it, your torsion, mm -hmm. right, on your head. And, and your, your pail. and your two jerry can, your Clorox jerry can, empty jerry cans of water from the Belfast River to the house. You know, so I, 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 I always say to people that I'm, hmm. and that's why I'm not afraid to say my age, because I think I look very good for my age. You do. But um, I, I, I'm, I really embrace the 70s and 80s. I think they were amazing years. And I think um, children of us who grew up within that age group, we really got a bit of the organic lifestyle. And I was saying to a friend of mine, um, you know, you, you would use the term wetty, like you felt you were not growing. <laughs> but we ate well, and it would mean that uh, we grew the right pace. So it would seem now that most of us who are approaching our 50s, we just not looking our age mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we grew well and we yes. ate organic foods. And we ate good vibes and we exercised them. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the work was hard. Mm -hmm. The work was hard because I remember, you know, we have to water all the plants. You have to sprinkle the dirt yard with water before you sweep the cocoa your broom. And so they were back hurting you. Yes. You know, but you have to you do have it. You have to do it. Because it was a chores. chore every day. Yeah. The yard had to be cleaned. Mm -hmm. And then you still had wooden floors, uh, you know. And you have to scrub that wooden floor every weekend. Yes, and and, and the blue soap. Correct. <laughs> and even even growing up in in, in Point Michel, um, as as young people, that's why today people who don't know think probably somebody like me can't cook. But same. I'm a very good cook. Yes. And that is because in growing up, you know, we had the responsibility myself and my my stepsister Gail. You know, one would keep cook on Saturday. And the other would cook on Sunday. So this weekend, whoever cooked on Saturday would cook on Sunday the mm -hmm. next weekend, and whoever and vice versa. You understand? So we learn to do those things. My stepmother would always have us. She's doing the laundry, but we probably yes. have the undies, you know, washing. <laughs> so we, we knew we knew what responsibility was. Mm -hmm. We knew what work was. Yes. We knew we grew up learning to cook. We would, I would take turns as well ironing our school uniforms. Mm -hmm. My stepmother was doing the, the major laundry. She was not gonna get us have us um coming to iron clothes for us. I we learn to do all of those things. Yes. And I think that is the point that you're making. Today, I can do anything and That's everything. It. You yes. understand? Yes. Um, people may think otherwise. <laughs> but, you know, but back to you, Carlton. Just yeah. sharing, you know, because I'm a child of the 70s like you. Yes. And I'm just, I just wanted to re-emphasize what you're saying yes. in that 
we are very well-rounded and we have a good head on our shoulders and we can do just about everything. Definitely. So, um, you know, growing up in Chimita, I, I had, you know, we grew up very well. Um, you know, there were so many fruit trees there because it was an estate. So you could find lots of mangoes and covers and sour soap. We remember going to, to, to even hunt for eggs. Mm. You know, there were many loose chicken or fowls and we would go looking for eggs up in the, the, the and when you, you get a nest with 12 and 14 and 15 eggs, you're so excited about that, that you've, you, you've gotten all those eggs to take home. So we had some real good time and, I, and you know, so I, I'm really liking this in the sense that people would see you and think that you were born bourgeois, yes, you, were, yes. you know, but I knew what it was to not yes. have flushing toilets yes. and to have yes. to go by the bee mm -hmm. to do number two. Or to eat pit latrine. Right, or to yes, use pit latrine. I experienced pit latrine. You know, even, before the, even before the pit latrine came in, mm -hmm. uh, because I remember when they began giving away those, giving out those toilets, um, you know, the health inspector would come to the house, the yard, inspect the yard, and make sure the, the, the area where it was going to be um, erected was was environmentally friendly, so to speak. And so uh, many of us at the time did not even have the luxury of that and would have to go by the bayside. Yes. Sometimes in the night to flashlight yes. to do number two. And use a stone. Oh uh, you know, uh, so I, 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 I <laughs> stone. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember that. So I remember the time when um, we were we were dumping garbage in the sea because we didn't know better, and uh, everybody dumped the garbage in the sea. Yes, yes. You know, you walked with your sack and you go and dump it there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so these were some of the the, 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 the early times of, of my life. But I remembered something though um, that was very distinct. Um, I have been told by by one of my aunts that when I was born, my mother spent. Um, Two, practically two months and, and, and a couple of weeks in the hospital uh, because I was born rich. So I was you born were, rich. Were upside down. Uh, yes. <laughs> and I was born rich in a, in a bad way. I had one leg came out and then the other leg came out. So it was really difficult for my mother as a young person and then having to be born that way. But I remember one time when I lived the way, I was talking to uh, somebody and I said this is how I was born and the person said to me well do you know the meaning of this and I said no and he said you were born in the one of the most beautiful ways it's difficult but it's very beautiful he said there are two meanings to it one you don't see the world upside down and that means that people will never fool you oh, nice. you can go in an audience and you can easily discern things and discern people so you're not one that's going to be jammed and put in confusion and stuff like that. And I, and I think I really believe that because this is really me. And two, irrespective of what comes your way, you must stand up because you came by foot. Okay, breaches. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I believe that philosophy personally. Okay. But when I was in the hospital, you know, I guess my mom is in the hospital, I'm in a nursery somewhere. Mm -hmm. And there was this nurse who was taking care of me, but she somewhere somehow kept on feeding me a bit more every time, you know, maybe I'm in a little distress, she'd come to my aid and stuff. Were you sick? Um, I think I had a little complication okay. because of how I was born. Okay. And you would, you would imagine medicine in 1974, mm -hmm. but it would have been like. Right. So the story that I've been told is that this lady, this nurse, kept on checking and checking and feeling so gravitated to that child. Mm -hmm. She was so old, the child all the time was feeding the child and so forth. So I think that nurse um, asked my mother um, where was she from and, and so forth and where was the father from. And the father, she said it's from St. Joseph. And the nurse said, well, I'm from St. Joseph. Hmm. So, what's his name? And my mother gave name. Whose name? Your father's name? My father's name. name. Mm -hmm. And the nurse said, this is her brother. You're <laughs> choking. <laughs> the blood. Yes. You see this where the connection came from? <laughs> That's amazing. That's fascinating.
fascinating. <laughs> yes. So, so your aunt is there as a yes, nurse in the hospital. Yes, my father never told he, nobody he was going to have a baby. Wow. Never told no, not his mother. But he not was his a sister. teenager, wasn't no, he? No, you know what? But, but I'll tell you, my father was the epitome of being an introvert. Okay. Very, very secretive and that type of person. Everything, you know, he just wouldn't talk. Okay. And so he never told anybody that he was going to have a child. And that is how I was introduced okay. to my father's side. So my grandmother, as she will, you know, she got the news. And I, I'll tell you for that, you know, if you were to see my grandmother, uh, my grandmother was really, <laughs> my grandmother was really looking like my dear. Everybody <laughs> who knew my bride in St. Joseph <laughs> would know how much my bride was a tall lady, big, you know, strapping lady, strong Adventist woman. You know, very picky here. Was Always she bold had, too? Huh? Was she bold? Bold. Always had many weeks, you know, behind the door. You know, I remember you go, you go in Mama's room and how many wigs, you know, are hanging at the back. So she just put them on to go to church because you never miss a Saturday service. You know, so Mama coming up to, to see her grandson and I, I was told, you know, we have a trademark in the Lando family. So when my grandmother saw my feet, she knew that was her child. What is it about the feet? Oh, feet are very thin. I see. Yes. Okay. So we, we all seem to have that kind of feet. Okay. Yeah. So, so Mama one knew. time she and the came in. Yes, my mother has a child. Okay. Yes. So my grandmother raised me from a very early age. But I must say though that having listened to the stories and even growing up, my mother was the fundamentalist. I, I cannot imagine a young person, um, a teenager like my mother, doing the job that she did so impeccable. I will tell you, I've never known my mother going to carnival mm -hmm. at my age. I've never known my mother, um, not maybe people might laugh, not wearing her slip <laughs> under her dress. So my mother is a very conservative, conservative person. Um, never know my mother in no, you know, stories. Uh, and these she was reserved. Yeah, these were traits that definitely I will hold for the rest of my life. And and to see somebody that young, but yet so responsible, mm -hmm. so responsible. And and this is. This is the, the type of mother that I grew up with. You were young, but I remember very well. My mother was extremely literate. Put me down, put me down. I got a lot of licks to read. You know, you had the Brian Nancy books, Caribbean mm -hmm. readers, as mm -hmm. it, it were called. It just came to my mind. And the, there were the purple colored one, the brown colored one, and the, there was a book called Miss Tibbs and Mother Hen, a red little book. And my mother would make sure we sat under this sat under this tree in the yard on the bench on a bench and we had to read you know and so she could she could have read very well and we had to, uh, taught, taught, taught me well how to read mm -hmm. so uh, for a young mother like that and I'm, sometimes you look at young mothers in today's world where they have so much and then they have they give the children such little time mm -hmm. this certainly wasn't my mother what did she teach you in terms of being a gentleman well, I think for one, mutual respect. Um, my mother is the most trustworthy person that I know. My mother is very confidential. And so my mother taught us to leave and let leave. So to respect all people, irrespective of the creed, their gender, their whatever it is, respect all people. And respecting people doesn't necessarily mean that, that you agree with everything that they say or do. Mm -hmm. But sometimes just being silent is good enough. Mm -hmm. So I remember that. Um, secondly, never be envious of others. We grew up poor, um, and there were many times the schools would have fed, particularly the secondary school, would have fed. And we were never children to go and ask 
our mothers to get us fancy clothes or even to dare go and tell our mothers um, go let us can we go across to the neighbor and ask them to borrow a shoe or shirt mm -hmm. to go to the fair? We'll never dare do that. So most of us, we would just, I, particularly I, would just stay home. I can't afford, I can't, I don't have the, the right clothes to, the, to go to that school fair. I stayed home and watched Little House in the Prairie and, and Be Witch and those things. Mm -hmm. I never stressed not stress up my mother about that. So we made do with, the, with what we had. And uh, the thirdly, um, to to be to to obey the law to be to to abide by the law um respect authority that's it respect authority and 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 this is something that uh, even for me now as a manager um i have had to learn and that in itself prepared me for where i am as as a, as a professional and as a, a leader as well and, and we're, we're going to get into some of that in just a while. But um, we have to touch on Carlton, the personality. Mm -hmm. Now, and I say that because one of the things that, I, first of all, you smell good. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that, guys. Yes. He, smells, he smells very good. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I think people notice about you is your sense of style. Ah. Yes, you, you have this sense of style. Um, you love colors tonight. You're in gray and black, yeah. but I know you love colors. You actually got married in yellow. Yeah, I got married in yellow. Yellow <laughs> yeah. and purple. Yes, yellow and purple. That's yeah. correct. So, where does your sense? What is your sense of style, Carlton? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I think I, I, well, I was always a very meticulous person, mm -hmm. very organized, mm -hmm. and it's, it goes beyond fashion. Um, I'm very much like that. Anybody who have been to my home know that I'm extremely meticulous to the point where I will, I will fold every underwear of mine and put if I put it in a drawer. That's all. And I and roll every tie of mine if I put it away. So my wife would say, you know, if I'm if I'm taking a trip, she would say, um, you're not going to 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 to, to pack your stuff. And I said, don't worry about me. I can pack a suitcase in 10 minutes mm -hmm. because I know where everything is. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as that for me. But fashion has always been something that I like. I think dressing up. But, but more so dressing with an identity. Not merely dressing because it's fashionable. Uh, because I'm not one that, that goes with everything that's in. I go with what, what accelerates me to the point where it can uplift my spirit, um, build my confidence. Um, so I like, I think you cannot be neat. You cannot be a neat person and not be a sharp dresser, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, Clean cut, man. Yeah. Nice. So I've always been that type of person. I think anybody who knows me from even school days would tell you that they went to school with me and I was always that. You could ask Miss Ellie's daughter. Okay. She taught me in secondary school. Mm -hmm. You know Ellis? No, I don't. She is the lawyer for Domlek? Um, no, I'm not sure. All right. Probably but, I yeah. know the person, but I but don't know that. You, you, yeah, you would know, yes. but she's from Newtown. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. But she would tell you that. So most people who know me, and I sure Mr. Ted Sira can tell you so too as well. I was always that type of person. Um, but as I developed um, and recognized, well, okay, um, I now make my own money. <laughs> <laughs> I now can afford certain things that I could never afford before. Yes. Um, so now, why not top it up a bit yes. and and give myself that look mm -hmm. and feel that I've always wanted. But it's a complete look, though, Carlton. Facts. So you're neat, Facts. you're sharp, you're clean cut. Um, the ball head is it by choice or the hair stop growing at some well, point in time? Well, that's a nice question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I was always low feed. Um, but then when Maria came and there was no electricity, I, was, I, would, I would cut my hair religiously every weekend. Okay. But when electricity, uh, when Maria came and there was no electricity, I said to my, my, my wife, um, I wonder what it would feel if I really go bald. So we have hair removing creams at work. Mm -hmm. I decided to go and play experimental. So I took one of the hair removing creams. And I pass it on my head, I leave it for a few at work? minutes. No, I would. Oh, okay. Leave it for a few minutes, and then took the wet cloth and thing, 
And then when it came out, I said, oh, I love my body. Mm -hmm. And then I just never went back. It suits you. And I just stick with my body from that point. So it from Mario you. to now, that's it. It suits you. And I'm sure the viewers, <laughs> those, of, those who can see you, will agree um, that it definitely, it definitely suits you. What do you enjoy doing, Carlton? What do I enjoy doing? Reading. Mm -hmm. um, if you come to my home, you'll see books all over the place. I love reading. I love writing. Actually, I have written maybe more than 50 poems. So I, I do write poems. I just have not written for a while. Um, but I like writing. I like commentary writing. Um, I like um, philosophical writing. So I like philosophy to read deep stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I like traveling. I love traveling, especially to visit monuments, um, historic sites. That intrigued me a lot. Uh, I have not been to Europe and I'm really looking forward to a European trip because I know this is where you get all this. Yes, it might be a bit colonial to some of us, right? particularly now with all this racism mm -hmm. um, talk going on. But it's, it's, it's things that I, I, I really like visiting. Um, I like, uh, I'm not much the adventurous type. Okay. Um, I actually love being in my house. I can be, I can close myself in my house for the entire weekend Me and not be bothered. Me and you, I, so. I, I, I can be like that. <laughs> I can be like that. Once I have the basic things yep. that I need, that's I it. I can for relate, me. Carter. So I am, I'm, I'm like that too. Children of the seventies. Well, <laughs> my, my sister Gail is like that too, to some extent. She's a child of the seventies. I am like that. You are like that. Yeah. So I'm sure there's quite a few yeah. people who are like. I, 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 I people ask me. Don't you get bored? My friend Daniel says, explore, explore the country, you need to get out. But you know, um, it, yeah. I don't mind it at all. It does not bother me. <laughs> My sister is just saying that I have a handwriting to die for. Oh, is it? Um, do yes, you? I do. Are you a pharmacist? Pharmacists have crappy handwriting. Um, for Diana, and I, doctors. I, 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 Steinberg had me taught me sociology and he would tell you that. He I showed me that I too. Right. So I can imagine he could tell you or testify about how my essays would be writing with these pens. The V V seven pilot pen. Mm -hmm. That's what I would take. Go to the library, do my research, and have my Harold Lambert's book, and write in <laughs> my beautiful essays. You know. So I've always had an excellent handwriting, mm -hmm. but English has been something that I've always liked. Um, so I I've always been a, a, a person that likes reading a lot. But I think I I my both my parents. My mother is a loves books and my father as well okay yes good stuff carlton we're going to take a quick break have a sip of water right. and we're coming right back this is the in the spotlight radio show the time in the studios is 8 53 let me again thank all of you who are joining us for the program this evening whether on radio whether through one of the online streams or on our facebook live and um, just want to say hi to a few folks i see on uh, Sabina is on. Um, I see Daniel is on. Hi, Roslyn. Roslyn is on. Um, who else am I seeing? There's quite a few folks who are on. Um, <laughs> I need to explore. All right. <laughs> this is the In the Spotlight Radio Show. We're coming back in just a while. Keep it locked right here. In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. In the Spotlight, featuring people from all walks of Dominican life, spotlighting their triumphs and tragedies, dreams, hopes, aspirations, untold stories, touching the human and personal side of all people in politics, religion, sports, business, music, culture, the media, and more. Get it to know our farmers, our public servants, youth, and the ordinary Dominica. Listen to their stories. No limitations, no restrictions, no holds barred. In the spotlight, we'll also spotlight interesting topics, issues, and relevant situations. Don't miss In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. In the Spotlight. We 
We are back at 8.56, the time in the studios. Don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms. I know most of you are probably using your phones to tune in, those of you who are viewing. Uh, if not, those of you who have a chance, go to our In The Spotlight radio show page, like our page, follow us. Go to the In The Spotlight radio show group. There's always something nice happening there. And I really appreciate how active the fans of the In The Spotlight radio show fans group is. Thank you guys. I really do appreciate all of you. And I mentioned a few of the other platforms before, so feel free when you have an opportunity to go there and to give us some support. We're back with Carlton Lando in the In The Spotlight radio show, our guest for tonight. Carlton, you, you have four brothers, four sisters, and one brother, but you lost that brother. Tell us what happened. Um, my brother Aaron Moses, my brother died in 1992. I remember that very well because actually he died the day before my 18th birthday. Um, that was May 30th, my birthday was June 1st. And I remember that even better because uh, I was doing CXC at that time. I remember the day that my brother died, I had done my uh, chemistry exam. I've done my chemistry exam. Um, Aaron died at the age of 12 in a traffic accident right, oh right in Jimmit um, on the main road. If you know that bus stop, that's where he, he died. Um, it was, uh, I don't, he was coming down the road with a bicycle and the bicycle had no brakes mm -hmm. and um, there was the Ministry of Bus coming from a clinic with nurses and doctors and they ran into him and he went unconscious and died um, about uh, two weeks after his accident he succumbed to his accident he was a first former of um, the same secondary school that I attended which was at the time since as a secondary school so he was uh, 12 years old when he died he was in first form and he was my only brother he was your only brother yes take us back to you as an 18 year old mm -hmm. do you remember how you found out that your brother was in an accident first and foremost right so the afternoon i think that chemistry exam killed me <laughs> i i i went to sleep the afternoon uh, when i got up uh my godmother told me that because i vehicles of, the road was cutting off so vehicles were passing inside of Jimmy. and my godmother i remember very well she said alas like she maybe thought I had no one and then she said to me, so I asked her, Elas for what? And then she's telling me, Well, my brother Aaron had an accident and he was taken to the hospital and he doesn't look good and so forth. And so immediately I I I got dressed and got to the hospital. When I got there, all the family is there and so forth. He was in theatre at the time and uh, we stayed practically for the entire night and um my mom, my mom never left the hospital in a sense, so she stayed with him for almost the two weeks, and then he died. I think he may have died. It was, I think it was a Sunday evening when he died. Yes. How did you feel about that? Well, it was a very difficult time. I mean, you're 18 years old. You have CXC exams. You're looking at your mother, how cross she is, losing a child, and it, it's, it, it was very difficult. But again, my mother, again, was the champion in all of this. Um, my mother really, really, uh, I should say, resiliently stood strong. She believed in her God. She believed God does all things well. And she buried her son. And she tells she left everything in God's hand. Mm -hmm. Yes. So even looking onto my mother, that was strength that we could all tap into. Mm -hmm. We could have all tapped into at that time. It was more difficult for my mother's husband, the father. He was, you know, he, he, dealt, he took it very, very difficult, but my mother dealt with it better. 
over time the yes. family healed. Yes. But of course your brother is not forgotten. No, they definitely. Not. Definitely. Is there any way that you all remember him in a special way? Well it's a long time, ninety two to now. Mm -hmm. Um but I think we still remember him. I mean we have photos of him, so mm -hmm. we we are even for me in particular, my only brother. I, I remember him distinctively. I think one of the things I remember very much about him is that he loved cooking and he had he had always said he wanted to be a chef. Oh. So I remember that well. Mm -hmm. Yes. But but Carlton, this is not the only tragedy that you would encounter mm -hmm. um, within your family, even mm -hmm. if not this immediate family, mm -hmm. but you also experienced tragedy with your father. Talk to us about that. Right. Um, before I go to my father, maybe I could talk about my sister. Okay. Right. Because then I had, my mother had four of us, well, four of us. I'm the first, then my sister who is Leah Fat Petrokarim, and then my brother Aaron, and then there was my other sister, Ayesha. Um, my other sister died in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, she was 27 years old when she died. Um, she died of cancer. Mm -hmm. That I... was even tougher for me than losing Aaron. Though Aaron died in a traffic accident, mm -hmm. but, um, the, because you would understand that the more you get, you, you live as a family together, the closer you get. Mm -hmm. So that's 27 years mm -hmm. of a sister that I yes. held as a baby mm -hmm. and chop her to school mm -hmm. and that type of thing. Uh, would write an excuse on behalf of my mother if my mm -hmm. mother doesn't have the time, you know, so that she can take to her teacher, you know, and then to see how she, how she happened to, to die because my sister was pregnant at the time when she had cancer. Wow. And um, she decided that, you know, the doctors were saying, you need to abort the baby. And she said, no, I do not want to abort my baby. She was very affirm. I do not want to abort my baby. I always wanted a child. God will never take the two of us. Was okay. she right? She was right. Okay. So my sister died. My sister had the baby at seven months. Okay. So the so you mean from the time she found out she had, had cancer, cancer, how far along was she? She may have been. She may have been about three months three into months. the pregnancy. Right. So rather than putting on weight, she was losing a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. So that was a bit suspicious. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, uh, because she's pregnant, you cannot do scans. Right. All right? Wow. You cannot do scans. But then they recognized that there was a mass. Right. And the through that, they recognized it was a cancer. Okay. So What type of cancer was it? So she had um, renal cell carcinoma, which is a type of kidney cancer. Okay. And this is the deadliest kidney cancer. And I can say that as a medical professional, because this is the only cancer... This is a cancer that does not respond to chemotherapy, neither radiation. So the probability is if you've had renal cell carcinoma, you may be you may have some remission for of ten years, but if it when it does come back, it is metastasized. Okay. So you will most, you likely, most likely die. die. Yeah. Okay. So if you've had that cancer, you will subsequently die. I found I found, um the former Prime Minister of Trinidad, Owen um the one he died of that ca that cancer. I just can't remember his name okay. um, right now. But he had that type of cancer. Okay. Yeah. So your sister is three months pregnant. Mm -hmm. Fine. Discovers that she has cancer, mm -hmm. and doctors are advising that she should abort and not have the baby, not carry the baby to term. Mm -hmm. um, is it that they were concerned that possibly she may not make it? To well. Because of the hormonal changes, and I would say as a medical person, that goes on in pregnancy, it would definitely grow okay. more cancerous cells mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. case. So they would have preferred that um, she, she would, even if she succumbed, but with fewer compl complications, mm -hmm. and at least it would sort of uh, lessen the aggression mm -hmm. of the cancer. Mm -hmm. but. She would not have that, not have and so what had to be done, um, Doctor Ferrara. I, I really thank him because he was thinking very fast. Um, he had to inject her with steroids to ensure that the baby lung would be developed. Here, Doctor Paul, in, so that they could take the baby at seven months. Okay. Because Pretty. once the lungs, yeah, once the lungs is developed, then at least the baby would have less complications in breathing, and so that happened. 
so he was taking that seven months from her and um, at seven months and my sister died the day before her son had his first birthday oh. yes so she died at home um, she died quite peacefully mm -hmm. it was the journey to her death was very difficult did she suffer she suffered a lot she suffered the cancer really was took a toll on her mm -hmm. really took a toll on her but again for Dinah, and I will use that as almost my common denominator this evening, my mother. Mm -hmm. The rock. Was again the rock. I mean, my mother had to be taking care of the baby because I'm working, my other sister Leaf is working. Um, mommy takes care of the baby. Her sister would come up every day. My auntie Diane would come up every day and do the morning chief, so to speak. So my mother could get a little time, rest, and maybe do things with the baby. Because my sister could never hold a baby because the cancer was had done so bad that it cut it sort of crippled her so she couldn't walk anymore. She just bed bombed. So she couldn't really hold a baby to see a baby in a in a cradle crying and you cannot even do anything for the baby. It was a bit difficult. But my mother had to be juggling, taking care of the baby, still taking care of a sick child, whole night, because I'm home, I'm in Dominic, but I was living in Portsmouth at the, at the time. My other sister is living, is, was living in, was it uh, Cochrane, St. Joseph? I can't remember exactly where she was living at the time. But mommy was, she was my, the one who was sick was it my mother. And my mother had to be juggling back and forth. But um, again, my sister succumbed and my mother was ultimately strong. Mm -hmm. My mother buried her two children went and sing at their funeral, do everything, never cried at their funeral. My mother always cried the day after the, the funeral. Day after. She had to be she, strong she for everybody, everybody. Everybody, she comes yeah. to you, pat everybody, she tell everybody it's going to be okay. The day after is always a difficult time. I hope I get to meet your mother sometime. <laughs> but my mother <laughs> is really yes. really she solid really sounds man. like you solid, know, somebody solid. Yes. yes that's what you call the strength of a woman that's it that's yes. it that's yes. it so she lost um she had two four of us the two last ones died mm -hmm. one died in an accident at 12 the other one died of um, cancer of cancer oh, yes then my father <laughs> and 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 we, and we will talk about her son yes after yes. when we're talking right. when we move to the other segment of yes. the program but let's get to your father so my father, um, my father and I, we were not very close. Okay. But I will tell you one thing for Diana. I knew that I loved my father with all of my heart. Mm -hmm. And because of who I am, I recognized that I had to understand my father. And understand that even for him, he did not have a father figure. So I had to forgive him. The ripple effect. Right. The, for the inconsistencies mm -hmm. that he displayed in the father son relationship. So you will hear me speaking very demarcatingly about my mother but may not say that as such about my father. But I knew I love him. Mm -hmm. And I knew that my father loved me. Mm -hmm. Because anybody that would mention my name, um, he would have the biggest smile. Mm -hmm. But my father just could not express emotions. And he wasn't the type of person that would, that would hug you or would even maybe open his mouth and tell you, good job, or I love you, or anything like he that. He was not emotional. He wasn't. So my father and I hadn't spoken in about, I went to see my father in 2000, I, I, I was living in St. Kitts. I decided I hadn't seen my father in many years. Let me take a plane and go across to St. Croix to spend two weeks with my father. Mm -hmm. That was 2001. Mm -hmm. I did that. Did he, did he know you were coming? Home yes, to I told him I was coming. Okay. So he welcomed me, we spent the two weeks together, everything. 
That was the last time I saw my father. How was that two weeks, Carlton, in terms of... It you, was... you speak of a strained... Sorry, my bottle. You speak of a strained relationship, but then you get up a few years after not seeing him for some time, and you go see him to spend two weeks. What was that two weeks like? It was, Did it fix it was like a stranger, like Aww. living with a stranger, because the orientation was not like, okay, how are you doing? Uh, I'm all right, and then what else? Like, what do you see? You know, like he would he would make sure that I had all to eat and stuff. He leaving in the morning, he tell me leaving. You know? um, if I need anything, if I need to go into town, if I need a lift, and that's basically it. He got home, go in his book, read his book, smoke his cigarette, and that's about it. So we really did not mm -hmm. have that that's connection. connection to really... You didn't reconnect. Nah, nah. But... Were anyway, you disappointed? Um, I did not feel disappointed, you know, because I just felt... Did you expect that was it then? Endemically, who he may have been. Okay. And I just felt he just seemed to be a person that preferred being by himself. Okay. Um, for whatever reason. And yes, we were in the same space, but some way, somehow, he just knew he had a son and this is who the son was and the son has done well and he's proud of of that but what can i do because maybe too he felt guilty that he hadn't invested mm -hmm. enough in in me mm -hmm. and here am i still looking out for him but so, it shows the type of person that you are right so sure. i hadn't spoken so i left him 2001 and that was it and then we talk in between, in between, but every time my father would say, you know, he lost the number and you get a number for him, you call him and you can't get him and then you just... So I just, I just said, you know, I'm tired. And I just decided, I, I, I give it up. I give it up. So I did not speak to my father for quite a long time, mm -hmm. many years. I remember an aunt of mine was asking me, she had his number and was asking me if I wanted that number and I told her no. And I felt I needed to do that to sort of heal or protect myself. Because there it is that you really long in. I was like, okay, I'm a pharmacist now. And I, I, I what if my father were to invest in me so like we could do a business together and start a pharmacy. You know, you were like hopeful. that was, oh my you know, God. that vibe yes. I had. Like, you know, what if, what if, what if, and it just was not happening. Mm -hmm. So then again, he said he's going to file for me. Never yes. happened. And I just didn't. I just, you know, it's like as though you just cannot believe. Mm -hmm. or you just, you cannot take this person's word there. So you just left. I just decided I'm a grown man. I have a career. I'm making my own money. I can't take care of myself. I don't need that stress. So I just literally put that to rest. So, remembering again, the aunt, my aunt, his sister, asking me for the number. I said to her, I don't want the mm -hmm. number. And that was my rationale. Why? So, it's 2011. No, it's 2000. When my father died. My father died 2012. Right. 2012, it was a Saturday morning. And I had... I don't know, I had a great energy and a nice vibes and feeling cool and good. Saturday morning, you're feeling the Saturday vibes, the emotions, the... You're working, but you know it's Saturday and you can relax. And so I'm, I, I got into work. As I got into work, Mrs. Dover, my, my colleague, says, Carlton, you know, your aunt said to call, to call her. Auntie Pim said to call her. So I'm like, okay. Well, Auntie Pim is Adventist, so I said, okay. Maybe auntie, I said, well, there was another aunt of ours who had gone to England for treatment and she wasn't doing too well. So I said, maybe auntie Emma died. So I make up my mind, okay, well, auntie Emma maybe died. So auntie Pim is calling me to give me the news that auntie Emma died. So I picked up the phone and nice and jovial. I said, hey, auntie, what's up with you? How are you doing? She said, hey, I'm fine, I'm fine, very calm. And then she says, um, how are you doing? I told her, I'm fine. She said, I've been trying to catch you. I said, well, I slept. Because at that time I was living in Portsmouth. So she said to me, I, I tried calling you later this morning, I couldn't get to you. And I said, well, I slept at my mother's house in Jamie, but did not have my charger. I forgot it at work. 
so my phone was dead, so that's why you didn't get me. So she said to me, do you hear, you know, did you hear anything, you know, you know, um, do you hear anything about your father? And I said, well, no. I said, well, I'm doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm doing. He has cancer. That was the first thing I said. Mm -hmm. So she said, no. I said, okay. So she said, well, we got news that your father died this morning. So I'm like, my father died? Like, my father died? Like, how, how mm -hmm. he died? Like, mm -hmm. what happened to him? So she said, well, it looks like he was murdered. Murder? Like, who murder? killed my father? Like, who would kill my father? Like, knowing my father is an introvert, knowing that he, he, he likes to be by himself, he doesn't, my father doesn't know what is trouble, who would kill him? So my aunt, like, she doesn't know when she's breaking down on the phone and she doesn't know, but she just knows that he was stabbed many times and that's all she knew. So I left, I went to the consultation room and Mrs. Dover came after me. I told Mrs. Dover I'm taking my keys, I am leaving. <laughs> I said I'm leaving and, the, I, I, and at that time I was, I was a pharmacist at Joyce. I just started working there, so I, I didn't have a, no, no managerial position, so I was a pharmacist, full. And I said to her, my father just died, I'm just getting the news, I am feeling like I'm floating in the air, mm -hmm. I, I, I am disoriented, I need to leave. Mm -hmm. I didn't care about work, I didn't care about nothing, and I wasn't crying at that stage. I was, I, I was just in a, like, in, I, I was like feeling like I was floating. I left, jumped in my car, stopped with my mother, tell my mother the news, then went to St. Joseph by my aunt. So while we there, more information coming, we found out that um, my father was stabbed 19 times at first, that was the news, he was stabbed 19 times. 19? 19 times. Um, he that, was that, that, that sounds like a like, right. like hit, yes. like, you know. He was stabbed 19 times and we made way. We left Dominica the Tuesday. So immediately bought tickets, everything, the various impala, hadn't seen all this time. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you loved him. Yeah, we went to St. Croix. Uh, when we got to St. Croix, it was the afternoon, so we could not have gone to the home and my father lived. So we went the next day. When we got to the home, it was, it smelled like death. It, I had, I, distinctively, I still remember that very keenly. It smelled like death. Um, it looked like a crime, site, a crime scene, although a cause of mine had begun to clean up with bleach because blood had spattered all on the walls because he's fighting off and he's getting stabs and you know, so the blood was all over the wall. And I remember very well, there was this stench in the yard and we kept on saying what's smelling like this you know what is smelling like that so it just so happened we went to the bin and here it was there were like two huge bathtub wheels soaked up with blood his blood that were just covered with maggots oh my goodness covered 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 with maggots mm -hmm. so it was mm -hmm. it was the real tough thing because it was you you really recognize it was symbolic to He's there, mm -hmm. you know, so this is the closest and we could not have seen him because of how um, badly he was, he was um, hurt. So we found out that my father was actually stabbed 47 times. Not 19. Not 19. He was stabbed 47 times and he was stabbed by his um, stepson. So my father had a relationship. With somebody else, mm -hmm. although he had his wife in St. Joseph. Okay. And he sort of adopted a new family, and the, the son of the girlfriend went to his home, opened and called him. He opened the door, pepper spread his eyes, and stabbed him relentlessly. Oh my God, that's you're getting me all emotional. Yes. Was the voice, was the person sick? Or well, um, it is said that um, he was bipolar. Okay. And he had 
uh, a rap because he was deported. He was in the mainland, New York, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. had to be sent back. And from the confessions he gave the police, he said that he was jealous of the relationship that his mother had with my father because he felt that his mother loved my father more, more than, than him. him. And this so boy he's was 27. 47? Yes, this boy was 27 years old. Yes. But it was one of the roughest part of my life. I mean, having lost my, my sister died in 2010, then my father 2012. So it's like you la you mm -hmm. less than two years. You know? mm -hmm. and, but it was difficult for me because it was, it was a spiritual loss, mm -hmm. it was an emotional loss, and it was a physical loss. Mm -hmm. Here it was, this boy who always wanted his father to mm -hmm. be close to him, lost that opportunity. And I lost it merely, maybe because I did not try again. Mm -hmm. So that may have been what that was one of the regrets I had. And then secondly, really realizing that it was permanently lost mm -hmm. and would never you never have the never have it again. again and when i begged you know to see my father and they said no sir we cannot let you see mm -hmm. him because he was so badly off that they said it would permanently um affect me so we saw him the day before he was buried and he had to be waxed mm -hmm. he, he had, had to, to be waxed, waxed. yes he had to be waxed. So that's what they did to conceal all of the... He was so um, badly, um, savagely punched that all his, even his bones were punctured. All his vital organs were punctured. My father was only 56 years when he, he lost his life. What happened to the boy? Well, the case was called. I was actually following that. The case was called and they found out that, well, Psychologists, psychiatrists, um, they said that he had a mind of a seven-year-old. I don't understand that because I'm like, why would you pepper spray somebody's mm -hmm. eyes first? Then, because my father was a very tall man mm -hmm. and he was a big strapping man. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So you would have understood that he would be defensive mm -hmm. if you hadn't not sprayed his eye, mm -hmm. right? But you came with all of your stuff. And you did that. But anyway, they said that. They said that he was really bipolar and he was sent back to the mainland to some mental institution. So is that where he is now? That's where he is now. He's still at a mental yes. institution? Yes. Yes. From what I know. And at the end of it all, Carlton, how did you feel about him? Did you feel that, you know, he knew what he was doing and probably... He wasn't as mental as as he was deduced to be, or um, do you think that probably he was in fact sick? Um, I okay, you're done. Yes, go okay. ahead. Um, again, being as objective as I am, and mm -hmm. my sister is here, and she will always say, out of the four children, I was the most compassionate and emotional one. I was the one that would always understand. And my mother would always tell me that, oh, you're always making excuses for people. Oh, you're always feeling sorry for people. You know what they do. But I was always that type of person. Mm -hmm. I always try to look at things objectively mm -hmm. and see what if. Mm -hmm. What if it may have been that. But I will tell you what. During that difficult time, I remember being in a church and it wasn't the funeral day. But we were in church that Saturday. We all decided to go to church as a, as a, as a family. And while at church, they started singing one of the hymns. And I just ran. This was a big church for Diana. And I just ran out of that church, really screaming. And I hadn't done that in all of my life. Mm -hmm. And I went and I fall down on the church floor. And I, right in front of the, the toilet and I'm screaming and I'm so hyperventilating like I cannot breathe and I'm, 
And I just cannot believe that my father really died that week. That week. And they had to, all of us had to just leave church. Oh, shall we? And they had to basically wanted to take me to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to ask you something very important, Carlton. And it has to do with forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Have you found a place in your heart to forgive that young man? That's why I can speak so freely to you. Yes. The song that... I've always been a very um, spiritual person. Mm -hmm. The song that was my salvation, my anchor in all of that was what a friend we have mm -hmm. in Jesus. Mm -hmm. I listened to that song over and over and over. And as I said, I like to be by myself. So I just listened to the song, what a friend. I listened to how many versions. I think the, my favorite version of it was from Dolly Parton. Mm -hmm. So you can always look, for, look at it, she's singing that. And I have listened to it and listened to it. And when I listened to the song, I recognize the importance of really believing God and letting go. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a process that I had to go through. It was raw. It was emotional because as I said, I was psychologically scarred, emotionally robbed, and physically disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And I had to think of what I was experiencing, but even more so think of the imprisonment of this young man. Not just imprisonment in physiology, but imprisonment in spirituality, imprisonment in psychology, imprisonment in emotions. And I had to tell myself, what would Christ have done? And then I go back to the Lord's Prayer. And that part that says, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And think about that. And as I said to you in the beginning, I'm a very deep thinker. So I don't just watch words and just repeat words. I think, I dissect. As we forgive those yes. who trespass against us. Who is the trespasser? Why should I forgive him? And I had to do that. So I had to basically dissect the equation. It's like if you do it an equation in math, mm -hmm. you have to break it up. Mm -hmm. I had to do that. And uh, this song help me and I liberate this guy liberate everything and I can say to you this evening the 15th of March at this time that I can jump on a plane go to New York go to that mental institution and sit down next to this guy just like we are and have a conversation with him. so you forgiven him yes and I wish him well That's the
my son. Yes, and 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 what I can see right now, Carlton, is that I hope and pray that you never face any similar tragedy like you have with the passing of your brother, your twelve-year-old brother, mm -hmm. your sister to cancer, and your father being murdered. I hope you never. I hope from now on. That all you have is a beautiful life. Thank you very much. I, I am. Yes, I, I I know everybody knows that I'm an old shishi, <laughs> and you know I'm really feeling uh, emotional about all of this. And I, I think for me, it's the forgiveness part. You know, being able to forgive this young man who took away your father, and the fact that you know you didn't have the opportunity to quote unquote like we say make up with mm -hmm. your father. I know that in itself, you know, would have touched you and affected you as well. Um but the forgiving heart that you have is 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 what is what's doing it for me here mm -hmm. um tonight on the program because bipolar or not, <laughs> you know, I don't think many people would be able to find that place in their heart. Um, to forgive somebody who stabbed their father 47 times. Yes. Killed their father yeah. brutally, you know. But you were able to do that. It may have taken you some time mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And to say you can actually go there now and have mm -hmm. a conversation with him, yeah. it means you've truly forgiven him. I, I think because I understood, um, I have understood the ramifications of mental illness. And you would recognize, I, as I did say to you, Earlier on, it's one of my platforms, it's one of my passions. I too, I remembered um, having a boot of depression um, in 2008, and I will share that story again. Mm -hmm. Please do. Um, 2006, I was in a beautiful place of my life. Mm -hmm. I was living away, had a good job, making good money, and really enjoying life. I mean, I was enjoying life in such a way um, for Diana that almost every other weekend I would travel. Wow. So if I felt like going to Puerto Rico just for the weekend, to shop, I, I yeah, to I could do that. Yes. And come back, get a flight and come back to work the very next day, straight, straight from the airport, straight to work. I was living that way and that life. But it was something that I just remember being very sad. Mm -hmm. And I, I called my sister, um, Leah, we're extremely close, and I'm just feeling really, really sad, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm just not feeling myself. So I said, let me go to see the doctor. I mean, I'm well known, and walk into the doctor's office, it was, I'm, I'm coughing, it's like, hi Carlton, what's up, what's up? And I said, doc, I'm just not feeling, you know, myself, and we're there talking and stuff like that. And then she's telling me that, I think you're going through a depression. And I'm like, with the years that I have been a pharmacist dealt with so many prescriptions of depression and hearing that thing, I was in denial. I said, mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. not <laughs> so, yes. so I remember smiling. I, no, I remember no. smiling and laughing. I said, no. <laughs> depression. Depression? Nah, I don't think so. She said, okay, well, I'm going to change the name. You know, she put affective disorder. Gave me some medication, sent me home, and told me to take a week off, started the medication. And in the fourth day of the medication, I started feeling suicidal. Yes. So the medication was yes, causing me to yes, feel suicidal? Yes, I started feeling suicidal. So, again, I remember it was hmm. very late. I picked up my phone and again I called my sister and I said this is how I'm feeling and my sister called my mother and my mother is a prayer warrior my mother is praying heaven down she Pentecostal praying whatever and the next morning I went to the doctor and I said to the doctor this is how I was feeling so she is like oh the drug she says this drug can do that the drug. It was the medication mm -hmm, she gave me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Made me feel mm -hmm. that way. Anyway, she said, it's not her expertise. What she would prefer is that I go to see a psychiatrist. Again, I am still feeling... You're in denial. Yeah. Depression, mm -hmm. psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. <sighs> okay. I took some time to think. I say, okay. 
I'm going to take some time to think. Two days, I went to see the psychiatrist. The most amazing psychiatrist that I could have ever met. And again, it comes back to my connection with God, the timing. Went to see the psychiatrist, and I met the most amazing, sensitive, empathetic person. And we started talking, and then, you know, they have to go through your whole genesis and mm -hmm. all kind of thing. And From stuff. the beginning. Right. And then the psychiatrist said something to me, and I, 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 I never forgot that. He said, do you know that in all your life, based on the records that is in front of me, you've had great, amazing time with the females in your life, but very bad times with the males in your life. So sure. your mothers, your aunties, they've yes, always sister. treated you very well. And the fact that you know, it came back to my father, my father wasn't dead yet. And so I had to deal with that. So that was the underlying factor mm -hmm. that caused the, yeah, the depression. Right. And having experienced that, and I will say on the show, and I've said it on many of my shows, that every single one of us who are adults will experience a depression in our lifetime. Believe it or not. And for Diana, it can happen very simply. Mm -hmm. You hear, I hear, it just so happened, they call and tell you your house is on fire, you've lost everything, or your loved one, your boyfriend, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. and it's like that. Mm -hmm. So having dealt with it for a couple of months, I decided again to read. So I read and I read and I read and I, and I became almost like an encyclopedia of depression. And I beat depression. You beat depression. I beat depression six rounds. Mm -hmm. And so from that experience, I have had a great affinity to helping people with mental health. With mental health. Even last week, I saw somebody who had suicidal ideation and I will tell you that in my office I have seen countless people who are suicidal who I have I have great links with both psychiatrists and I can they, they will take my call at any time so I don't play psychiatrist I will make that disclaimer mm -hmm. but at least I open that vent for people to come to talk to me I have had many people who cut themselves, cut their risk, and don't feel no pain. So God has placed me in such a, a position through experiences to understand the pains of people and to lend that helping hand to them. And that's why I say to people, my greatest teacher has been the bad times of my life. Mm -hmm. That's been the most powerful Depression, teacher. loss. Yes. It has several. been. It has been my greatest teacher. Tragedy. And so, if you see me on the street, like most of you do, you'll realize they will never, you've never seen a doll face in me. You will never see You're a doll moment working. in me. Mm -hmm. Never. Because I've learned to be the champion. Mm -hmm. The mental champion. Mm -hmm. And if you learn that, Strong mind, strong man. If your mind is strong, you will be strong. But it begins with your ideology. You must have a clear, decisive, and constructive philosophy. I live with that mantra. Sometimes in life, we have to be uncomfortable to become more comfortable. You built a house, but it just so happened you want to make your, your master bedroom bigger or fancier. You don't want to take dust now, and you don't want to have to take out clothes and things. Now you're uncomfortable for a moment, but what? You want to be more comfortable. So in life, it's like that. We want to be very comfortable, but it will come with discomforts mm -hmm. at times. And these are the discomforts 
that have to shape us and give us the fortitude to be able to live life in a victorious manner. You're powerful, Carlton. Thank you. You're powerful. Carlton, you're a pharmacist by profession. Yes. We, let, us, let us go back, backtrack yes. a bit, and let's talk a little bit about um, your education. Right. And we can just go through that. That's it. And, and get to the pharmacy, That's it. pharmacy part. Right. So let's start. So I went to, um, I didn't go to preschool. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know for what was the reason. I was, I, I'm too young to know. I, I was too young to know. I don't know. But I didn't go to preschool, but I sure was hope school yes. in preparation for primary school. By the way, let me just say thank you for sharing with us, you know. Oh, sure, man. Um, all what you just shared with us. Yes. I think you're really touching a few people out there. Yes. And I think it's probably it's probably getting very deep for, yes. for, 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 for the viewers and the listeners and so on. But we thank you for that, Carlton. Thank you. You never know who you've helped That's tonight true. by sharing. That's true. Um, our time is creeping up on us, yes. as it does yes. when we're having really good <laughs> programs. <laughs> so we just, um, we're just going to talk to Carlton about um, his, 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 his career yes. as a pharmacist and how it all began. Right. Keep it locked. One second. Forty topics and issues, intriguing and entertaining, a must listen to in the spotlight Monday nights from 8 p.m. on Q9. Thank you for that, JL. Back to you, Carter. Right. So, where did we go to school? All right. So, no I, school? I no preschool, but I show I was homeschooled. My aunt teacher people must have taught me along the way somewhere. Uh, Auntie Pim in, in Saint Joseph. Good evening. She was my principal in primary school. So after that, I went to the SDA Seventh Day Adventist Primary School in St. Joseph. I think I may have been in the third batch or fourth batch of students. I think Auntie would have told me so. Um, because the school started in 1970-something. So I was in the early batch of students. And my memories there was very, very um, deep. Uh, it, was the, the, it was how we knew school was. With the blackboard and and while looking at your nails and your teeth and and your hair, the teeth, your principal passing and you know mm -hmm. all of that. We went through those things. Um, got a lot of leaks for fractions and timetables. You have to know your timetables mm -hmm. like that. And my aunt was a mathematics guru. You just couldn't get away with Auntie Pim and you know not knowing your mathematics, your, your timetables and these things. So um, after that, I. Did come the common entrance the first time, failed, mm -hmm. uh, went the second time, and passed. Okay. And I just got a pass. All right. But believe it or and not, that's okay. I was the only boy to pass. <laughs> <laughs> I was the so only so boy there was something yes, special about something passing. Special. Yes. So I was the only boy to pass. When I went to St. Joseph Secondary School, at the time it began as Dominico Grammar School, but it, because it was a branch of, of Dominico Grammar School, but then whilst we were there, it became independent. And so we were introduced to our own uniforms, and it was St. Joseph Secondary School, where I spent five years, and I graduated, left there, and went to Clifton Deputy College, where it's sociology and English. Uh, fun times. I, I, I was a huge fan of sociology, enjoyed debating. I remember the first thing that Stan began we did when we got into class, uh, the first thing made everybody stand up and pray, and then ask you, who did you pray to? What, who did you see? And everybody said they saw a blue-eyed Jesus. <laughs> and, you, know, and, and, you know, so it, it was all about construct, ideological construct. I think and you taught me sociology right. as well. Like so, right, so I remember that very well, and what makes a thing a thing, and, you know. So it, it was really good, and most people who would have gone to, um, would have, would have um, been at classes with me, would have maybe thought I would have gone into sociology mm -hmm. or broadcasting or communications because I really liked um, these areas. Um, because again, I always enjoyed English and literature. It would have been easy for me to get into that area. But it just so happened at high school I did sciences. Mm -hmm. And one day, um, an aunt of mine, I done finished college, she saw me, she was a nurse, the spear, Donna Bell Pierre. And she said to me, my nephew, what are you doing? I tell her, well, auntie, I just I've got no job as yet, something like that, so I'm just waiting. So she told me, you don't want to study how to be a pharmacist? Mm. I tell her, pharmacist? 
She told me, yes, they started the pharmacy school and they're looking for, for young um, students and so forth, you should go. So she gave me the contact and whatever it is. And I decided to do what I said, for that I know I don't get money mm -hmm. to go. And my father not checking me. My mother doesn't have no big job or anything. Where am I going to get this money? Boy, let me tell you, God was so good that I went to Aid Bank for that I know. And the favor of the staff at Aid Bank, they gave me the loan. I didn't have no collateral. Well, you were the lucky one. I That's got the loan, the student loan. <laughs> I'm telling you, I got the student loan. You were a lucky one. And so I did. Did you have to pay? Were you doing? Were you going to be doing the pharmacy course in Dominica? Yes. In okay. Dominica. Maybe that's Free right. Years. Yes. Okay. So I did the pharmacy program um, at the Princess Margaret Hospital at the time. Now it's done at the State College. Um, I did the program, and we. It was a three-year program. We ended in 1998. And after doing that program, it was a very comprehensive program. I remember the final exams, you had to pass 75% um, was the pass mark for you to be registered. You had uh, um, practical exams where you have to go and make a job, and then you have oral exams where you have to sit in a panel with the doctors and so forth, and they can ask you any medical question, and you have to expound and talk and think, and then you have your written exam. And then I, after that, your your in your transcript is sent to the medical board. They review it after it's it, they are they are satisfied. Then they they write to the registrar. That's how it's done, and the registrar gives you your certificate of competencies. Okay. So that's how you become a registered pharmacist or registered nurse um, as well. So you must be registered or a registered doctor. Mm -hmm. So um so I got registered in nineteen ninety. So you did well. Yes, okay. I did well. Mm -hmm. um, in nineteen ninety eight. Now, as a young pharmacist, I already feel like, boy, I feel like I need to get some experience. Mm -hmm. So my friend Alfie Joseph, very dear friend my of mine girl. from years gone by, she was working at Stefan. So I said, Alfie, I'm thinking of moving out of Dominica, maybe try to get a job as a pharmacist somewhere else. Um, I'm going to go in the yellow pages, look for those addresses, and the, the big yellow pages mm -hmm. go, look for the addresses myself and write the applications and bring them for you to fax for me. Okay. I did that. Mm -hmm. For Dina, the same time I faxed the, uh, the, the young lady, faxed the application for me, I got a response. First response from St. Kitts. St. Kitts? St. Kitts. Mm -hmm. And I got the job right away. From St. Kitts? And the people telling me, yes, and the people telling me, I got registered in July, and I applied in August, and they're telling me they need me in September. And then, two days after, I'm getting another applic um, and my another response from Grenada, from Keaton's Pharmacy in Grenada, telling me they will so give me a job. So the applications you sent out, both of them were successful. Were in the region. Yes, in the region. Okay. Send kids and Grenada, and I got the job, in two places. Both jobs? Yes. Okay, what so, did you decide? I decide, okay, Grenada is with what I learned. St. Kitts is with what I learned. I've never been up so. <laughs> Let me try up so. And that was that it. Was it. <laughs> and then in the mere fact, the people telling me that they want a manager, yes, a pharmacist, but they want the person to be a manager. This is the amount of money, and they paid for my passage. To, I didn't have to pay passage. Mm -hmm. It was just God's favor. They paid for my passage, paid for everything. I got an apartment with everything in it, and that was it. So I got to St. Kitts. You went to St. Kitts. And I spent 10, ten years in St. Kitts. 10 years. 10 years. Really. 10 good years? 10 good years. Really enjoyed the experience there. I worked several places, and I must say the favor of God was really with me because I, I just developed my craft. But I'll tell you what, yeah? I kept on telling myself, God, I did not call myself to be a pharmacist. You chose that career for me because never in my mind would I have ever thought of this as a career. I didn't even know what was a, ph a pharmacist. I didn't think of that. So God chose it for me and I said, God, I'm going to give, do my part, and I'm going to make sure that I'm the best at this. Mm -hmm. The best. So I went to St. Kitts and I gave my best and 
every job I got for Dina, somebody else recruit me for a better position. And that's and what happened. Won. And that's what happened. I never... So you didn't me. stay with the company that brought hold you on, to hold on, hold on. The, the last time I wrote an application was when I was going to send kids. That's the last time I wrote an application in my life. I am at Jordan's and I didn't write an application. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I worked in Zengis for the 10 years and within the 10 years I worked for three different companies. Okay. Now I'm on the third one. While I'm working at City Drugstore, TDC, if you know TDC is the biggest company in St. Kitts, they own the pharmacy that I worked for. I'm getting a call from Dominica, from Michelle Williams, that used to be at National Bank. Yes, of course. I telling me well. that he's heard a lot of good stuff about me. I never heard about who's Michelle Williams, mm -hmm. nothing. Telling me that he wants to start a pharmacy and I was the one that was highly recommended and he will do anything in his power to get me back to Dominica. That's Michelle for you. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so, as transparent as I am, because this company was so good to me, I went to the HR. I said, Mr. Knight, I have gotten an offer from Dominica. And this is the offer. They, I told them if they're serious, right? Me. Mm -hmm. So they wrote me. <laughs> And they're giving me this, and the, all the terms and conditions I get in, um, um, what do you call that, after the contract, um, what do you call that, the money you get after the contract? Gratuity. Right, right, I get all of that. So Mr. Knight said to me, Carlton, as much as we love your work, home is where the heart is. I would advise you to take the job. I didn't just leave them, and I know today or tomorrow I could have gotten back my job in some kids. So, Michelle Williams sent for me. All expense paid, send packers um, to come to my apartment, pack up all my things, I don't, pay, I don't pay a cent, send them to Dominica, and I reach Dominica. And I end up back in Dominica. That's why I end up back in Dominica. So I told myself that I'm going to be in Dominica for four years. That's the term for the contract. Two years first, then, and then I said to myself, I'm going to do that. And then after that, I'm going to Canada. <laughs> I told myself I'm going to Canada. That's it. Two years in Dominica, and God did not. That was it for me. I had to stay here to change my nation. What was the pharmacy that you came to work for in Dominica at the time? Um, Bayside Pharmacy. Bayside it Pharmacy. It was in Portsmouth. Okay. Bayside. So right. I was the manager there. Mm -hmm. um, I did four years with them, and then after that, I the the relationship became a little strenuous, mm -hmm. um, and I decided to. Um, leave. I was never. I, was, I have never been fired from a job mm -hmm. there, but I decided to leave, and I, I, I so I, 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 left, and I went to the states. Okay. Take a breather. Mm -hmm. Came back to Dominica, just relaxing because mm -hmm. I told you I'm thinking of going back out. It's Canada. You want to go? Orange Jolly calls me and tells me that if I would want to come and work for them, could I not believe it? I went to work at Jolly's Pharmacy for two thousand dollars less than what I was working for. At the other pharmacy. Yeah. Upa is two thousand dollars less. I went to work there for. Mm -hmm. But it was the gateway to the amplification of my career. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, and that's why I said to you my spiritual journey and how I was born. Sometimes you have to forget emotions mm -hmm. and you have to embrace objectivity. And it was the best decision I have ever made in my career. How long have you been at Johnny's Pharmacy now? So I am going on 10 years this July, this July 4th. I started on July 4th. America holiday gives me 10 years. And currently I am head of public health, public relations. And I'm the sales manager there as well. What does that entail, Carter? Um, so I am responsible for all our public health. I know we do have a Ministry of Health mm -hmm. and we have a health promotion unit, but the government cannot do it all. And I have a great, great, great love for public health. And so I have basically specialized myself into that aspect of medicine, preventative medicine, education, promotion, where I speak to people about... Um, health and wellness. Mm -hmm. um, I also am um, responsible for um, 
public relations, mm -hmm. so everything to do with the good name of the company. And we've collaborated on a few that's things. It, right. <laughs> and of course, sales is one of my other passions. I love selling. So I am responsible for the sales portfolio for the company. It's it's a lot of work it and to, like job, to juggle work. all these responsibilities. But with the competencies and my ability, I, I am a person, I, I, I love to be busy. I, mm -hmm. I cannot, I love to be busy mm -hmm. and I'm always at it. And occasionally we still catch you at the back of the company. Yes, I, because I mean, you, you, you need to, you, you must um, continue your practice. Mm -hmm. So at least occasionally from time to time, I still go and dispense medicines, but I don't do much of it. But what I do now is more consultancies. So people come to see me and uh, I, I, I hear the situation, assess it, and would, would assist them um, based on what is the situation with them. What, what, what do you enjoy the most about the job you do now? Um, for me, what I enjoy most is impacting humanity. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that uh, no career is um, viable or vital without impacting humanity. We brought here, some of us um, have gotten the best of education and the best of opportunities, but if it's not making humanity better, it is futile. Mm -hmm. And this is what I, 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 I pride my, my, myself in every day, and also to be cognizant of my legacy. Now that I am a father, what would I want people to say of me when I'm gone? Mm -hmm. And how would I want my legacy to impact my children that they would sort of build on it? Mm -hmm. So I, I am broader than just about uh, a practice. To me, it's a relationship, relationship that is reciprocal. Um, I relate to you, you relate back to me. Somebody says With a it's level about, of respect. It's about people. It's you about love people. people. It has to be about people. And I will tell you, People can stop me at whatever time. I mean, even you for that, I know your personal oh, pharmacy. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and you will call me at any that's time. That's correct. And I will respond you to, will the, assist. to the soonest. Yes. And that is how I am. appreciate that. That is how I am. I mean, yes. my number is like, a, I feel like almost a <laughs> prostituted number. And I, I never shame anybody. No. I say, where you get my number from? Where are you calling me from? Mm -hmm. For, you know, I, I listen and I, I assist um, where I can. Definitely. Yes. Uh, Carlton, a few things um, just to mention here. Awards? Um, we're not at the awards <laughs> yet. Um, Pfizer, you were the local representative yes. for Dominica for yes. Pfizer. I enjoyed that company. What was it? What, I mean, what did that entail? Um, I was um, the local representative for Pfizer for two years. So I was the brand ambassador, um, brand manager for mm -hmm. Pfizer, all Pfizer products. You know, Pfizer is the, fa the famous maker of Viagra. Okay. Oh. So, <laughs> so basically, I was responsible for detailing all of their, their drugs to the local doctors here and would let the doctors know why they should prescribe the drugs and that. But I was even more so responsible for all of their formulas, their mm -hmm. infant formulas. So I had to go overseas um, to do some vigorous training on um, infant nutrition and, and, and infant um, uh, uh, an an infant, and so um, that made me. I went to Panama, spent some time there, um, spent some time in Dominican Republic, um, uh, so I spent some time in Trinidad, spent some time in Curacao, having traveled and, and to go to those uh, conferences. And at, after each conference, you had an exam to, to write because you want to make sure that the information you give into the doctors um, is is credible is relevant and is up to date. Mm -hmm. You cannot go to doctors and talk crap because you yourself have to know what you're talking about. So it was it was an excellent experience. I enjoyed being a, a medical rep for Pfizer and uh, it, it really made me know a lot of um, new places too. Yes. You served on the board of directors of the Caribbean Association of Pharmacists, headquartered in Jamaica. How did that happen? Well, um, I went to a conference, the first conference I had been to, and immediately when I got there, um, the president, well, he wasn't the president at the time, but he was very big in the association, he just ignited with my spirit. And so the first time they asked me to moderate, because they said, oh, here's this guy, he speaks so well, or whatever, we believe he can moderate. So 
put him on and they put him on. And that the first conference that was in Guyana. So I went to the conference and I'm moderating. It's a huge conference with over um, more or less like about a thousand five hundred um, pharmacists from all over the region, all the way from um, Hispaniola, Dominican Republic, to um, Suriname. So all the Caribbean pharmacists meet at that conference. And I'm here um, moderating. And I enjoyed life. And then, then they voted me to be on the board after a year. So that's how I ended up being on the board of directors of the Caribbean Association of Pharmacies. It was a very, very privileged um, experience. It was one that, that really mattered me and made me understand about um, how large organizations like that operate and work. And I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. You've received some awards. I'm gonna read off three of, well, at least what I have here. So you've received the Caribbean Community Pharmacist of Distinction Award for 2019 from the Caribbean Association of Pharmacists. You received that award in Florida. You also received the CAP Star Award, which again is the Caribbean Association of Pharmacists. Uh, the Spirit of Pharmacy Practice, and you received that in 2017 in the Cayman Islands. You received the CAP Executive Awards in Belize and 2018 in Cayman for your contribution to the Executive Board of CAP, which I suspect is what you just mm -hmm. spoke about. The Caribbean Pioneer Pharmacist of the Year in 2016 in Guyana, and you also presented as a guest speaker at the Clinton Global Foundation Conference in St. Thomas, USVI in 2019 on the topic Sustainable Health for All. And that for you, I suspect, might have been one of the most memorable experiences you've had. Yes, for them. Meeting President Bill Clinton and Mrs. Clinton face to face was... Uh, <laughs> It was. It oh was my God! You can't even speak of it. <laughs> it was. It was. It was really an honor, and and even more so uh, when I received that call from an NGO, um, saying that they had heard about my work and had heard about my passion for public health, uh, particularly after the hurricane, and they wanted they wanted me. So they paid. It was an all expense trip. I didn't spend a cent um, to come to to come to the back to. To, to St. Thomas and to be um, a, on a panel of three uh, to, talk, to talk on the topic sustainable health for all. So definitely I, am, I embraced it, you know, and went there and represented Dominica very, very well um, and spoke about our, our resilience in health, um, what, what the hurricane had meant for. It did not destroy our, our spirit and our people were strong because we were nature people. We knew what it is to survive. God had blessed us with fertile soil and he had blessed us with abundance of water and we had the vegetation and we were the food basket and we ate well. So it meant that even after the hurricane, yes, we were getting the barrels, but we had to go back to agriculture. Mm -hmm. So I spoke a lot about that and, um, and that was really a big stage for me. I, it, it's something that, again, has done really well for my career. The awards, I mean, um, 2019, I won the Caribbean, the Caribbean Community uh, Pharmacies of Distinction of the Year Award. And when we talk about the Caribbean, we're talking about all these islands and countries. And you see, you know, Little Dominica, Little Carlton, you know, um, you know, Dominican Fellow, you know, but it's impact and consistency. And I want to say to my to 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 my peers and to other professionals, uh, what you do. Be passionate about it, be consistent, and be true to it. And once you are like that, you, you are an original, and it cannot be taken away from you. And so um, the awards have not changed me in no way to the point where I'm pompous or I'm booster or I'm anything like that. But I always say it's the people's award. Mm -hmm. um, because if I did not have an audience, how could I have a career? Agreed. You understand? Well, congratulations on <laughs> all of them. Thank you. And like um, the audience, those who are viewing, at least I can see what they're saying. I, I can't hear my 
um, list radio listeners. They must be you know speaking as we go along as well, congratulating you and so on. But I can definitely see it from those who are on the Facebook Live. So congratulations to you, and we believe we all believe that it's very well deserved. Thank you. As we're getting ready to to begin wrapping up, um, Carlton, let us speak about some of your motivators. And one of the things that you have listed here is your mother and your children. And I want you now to tell me the story about your yes. children and one the one in particular, and it relates to uh, the okay. story you shared earlier yes. on as it relates to your right. sister. So, as I said, my sister was pregnant at the time when she found out she had cancer and she um, had her son was taken from her at seven months. It was a boy. Mm -hmm. um, he was named Caden, which means spiritual fighter. Okay. And he is doing extremely well. My mom had him um, in the earlier times, but I was the one, my, me and my sister, really financing his entire upbringing. Um, yes, it's one thing that you can have somebody taking care of the person, but a child is money, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And from the get-go, I, I have been taking care of this boy. And I always said to my mom that um, when Kate would have gotten to the age of about nine years old, I would take over so that she can really enjoy her retirement yes. and relax. And I have done that. So now he lives with me, he's my son, I do not call him my nephew. Everybody that knows that, I will know that this is my child. Um, I see him as my child, he has the same portion of love to my biological child. If I have to share um, my, my, my belongings, it will be equal. Mm -hmm. I don't see him as nothing, Other nothing than, your son. than my son. Yes. I loved him, even the, when my sister was dying, I said to my sister, be not afraid. I must take care of that child. And I am in his life for a purpose. He loves me to death. And he is doing extremely well at school. He has promised me that he's going to be in the first 20 students at the common entrance. So that position. means he's about 10, 11. He is, he is 11. He's 11. He's a little scholar. All right. Yes. I hope he does well. Yes. And he does emerge in the right. top 20. And I have my daughter, yes. Zinzaya. Um, Zinzaya is like her daddy. She's very um, extrovert. Very bubbly. Oh my God. Very extrovert. <laughs> um, she, she, every day she wants to be a teacher and, and that type of thing. And um, everybody would know who knows me. Um, it's almost like Zinzaya is always with me. Um, I'm a consummate father. I always say that. I, I live for my children. Um, and I um, I love being a father. I enjoy it 200%. I love being a father. I, I, it's just an amazing, amazing thing to raise up children and to, to raise them up in a modern way, but yet still with the fundamental principles that are still there to me. And so I don't beat my children. I've never beat them. I don't believe in Canaan. But if they come to your home or you see them, you will be wondering how am I doing it. Right. But You're married? Yes, I'm married. You're married to Shelly To Shelly Ann. My yeah. wife is Trinidadian. That's a long story how I met her. But I will say thanks to Julian Morris. Um, he was the one who linked us. Oh. Yes. <laughs> and that's how I met her. Okay yes. then, all right. So I guess um, I'll have to get that story um, <laughs> offline. You speak about your motivators as well being your life experiences, especially the tough or what you refer to as the bad ones. And you speak about those, I guess, who influence you and motivate you, Deepak Chopra, Jack Ma, Dalai Lama, and John Maxwell. Yes, um, as I've said from the beginning, I'm a, a very deep reader. I don't read superstitious, super, superficial stuff like novels and so I don't have the time for it. I like things that um, really can motivate me. Um, uh, like there is, there is a, a, a word that I, a, a phrase that I use all the time. I am worthy because I was born, mm -hmm. and I live with that, and I believe that. So even when I feel down, or I may feel hopeless, I say that to myself because. You cannot have hope without faith, mm -hmm. and you cannot have faith without courage. Let me say that again. Say it again. You cannot have hope without faith, and you cannot have faith 
without courage, and you cannot have faith without peace. Mm. Makes sense. You cannot they have leave. faith without peace. There's definitely you'll be shaky. Yeah. Right? And these are uh, affirmations and and um, deep philosophies that I have picked up from books that I've read. And these are, are, are what have guided me along the way. So have made me very resilient. I'm, I'm really not a person who is bombarded by what people think of me, particularly if it's negative. Mm -hmm. I really you will not find me, Carlton Lando, walking with my head down in no way. That's a perception of me. I know who I am and I live in the affirmation. So while you worry or you stress out yourself, I am the victor and will remain the victor and will walk in the victory all of the time because of these affirmations that I have made to myself time and time again. And I raise my children the very same way with these affirmations. I taught them early o'clock what it is to have a strong character, what it is to gravitate towards positivism, what it is to free your spirit from negativity and not engage all of your time into things that are futile and things that will not grow into your life in a positive way. And so when when I walk on the road and I and I meet people, this is the authentic me. I'm not copaweso. I am not fresh. You're confident. I am confident. So don't misconstrue or um, confuse the two and think that this fellow thing is all that. Um, I, I am just as you. And as I said to somebody, I know that I'm human. Why? Because every day, if I just take my hand and I just do this, it's a reminder that I'm dust. Mm -hmm. And dust I'll return. And so therefore, I am no bigger or better than you are. And that's why every soul is important to me. I see people as a living soul, as a spirit. And that's how I respect people. And that's how I am able to mingle and to treat everyone with equality. What does the next chapter of your life look like, Carlton? Well, that's a good question that you've asked. As I said, all of the challenges that I have been through and have gone through have been the purpose of God. And I believe so because of the links that he gave me. Look at this. God chose me to go to the Clinton summit and link me to all the key people that I need for my next chapter, which is, which is to have a foundation for mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, so people who suffer with mental illnesses, I would like to have an NGO whereby the NGO will be able to buy the medications for them because some of these antipsychotic drugs are very costly. And if people are not adhering to medications, then they will relapse all the time. So a lot of the times you see people on the road and they're mad because they can't afford the medicines. Mm -hmm. And if they can't afford, mm -hmm. then they will regress. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Two, to help with psychosocial therapy. A lot of people want counseling, don't know who to trust. People are not trained mm -hmm. to do the counseling. And so the foundation will help with that. To help people with rehabilitation and uh, a sense of purpose because when your mind is gone your life is gone so to speak uh, a sick brain um, is a sick body and so therefore rehabilitation so that's my next chapter to really um, get into my hands dirty into that to start a foundation to help people no person should have to suffer with depression to the point that they commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody should have to suffer. And every one of us can play our part by making some time 
to just listen to somebody when they say, I need to talk to you. <laughs> just take some time. And if you cannot help the person the way that the person may need to be helped, find help for them. Cotton, I love this. Find help for them. I love this. How far along are you in terms of getting to well, I am networking the with, of this? I, I am networking with people. I have spoken to the two psychiatrists already. Uh, because I would have to rely on them for technical support mm -hmm. because when you're doing NGOs, you have to come up with some uh, 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 reports in terms of mental health in Dominica or that kind of thing. I don't have that statistics. I don't have that information. And so I would rely on the technical support from both psychiatrists, social workers and so forth to help me with that and then, you know, and then get it going. But it is my next chapter. I'm, I'm praying to God that he will give me the life. Uh, the vision, uh, well, I, I have the vision already, but the mental capacity, the knowledge to be able to ensure that it is, it is, it is, it, it gets into fruition. But definitely, this is what I want to get into. And again, it's because of my love for people, and particularly the marginalized. And, and, and I'm sure, to some extent, the experience of The experience, yeah. because it was a scary experience, mm -hmm. you know, to wonder, my God, am I going to lose my career? What if I, I, I have to be hospitalized and it gets out there? And you, 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 you see how the stigma and discrimination mm -hmm. gets in mm -hmm. where it, it perplexes people and it, it, it puts more strain on them. So instead for them to be thinking clearer and better, they are now um, thinking more pessimistically uh, to the point where they can even get themselves sicker. Mm -hmm. And so with the intervention, of letting people know, listen, you're not alone. There are many people who have endured depressions and just never even knew or never even told anybody. Some maybe even attempted suicide and were so ashamed that they never said anything. And so what we want is to have that discussion, have that dialogue whereby people now will know that there is a place that I can go when I do feel that way to get the help and rehabilitation that I need. What a powerful, powerful session there with Carlton Lando on the In The Spotlight radio show. Very, very fascinating, Carlton. Thank you. We have to wrap things up now and I'm going to afford you the opportunity to um, share your final comments with us, what you would like to leave us with. As my battery power comes up and says to me, it's 15%. <laughs> yes, Carlton. Well, um, Dominica and the Caribbean the world by extension, I must say it was my pleasure. I was a bit cold fit. You uh, were. As, as talkative as I am, I was very much cold fit um, doing this show. But again, I believe the inspiration and power of God came through. And he really led me into places to really share um, an insight as to, yes, you might say I'm still young, I am only 47 years old, um, you know, but in that 47 years old, I can tell you that I have experienced the power of resilience. And so, whatever you're going through, um, you may have to deal with someone who may have murdered your child, your daughter, your husband, your 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 relative and is having a battle um, you might be in church every day and still have difficulty forgiving that person remember that you're not forgiving the person for the person but you're forgiving for yourself you're forgiving to get your liberation you're forgiving to experience that peace of god that passes all understanding and if you and ask yourself what would Christ have done? And if you say that you are truly a Christian and a child of God, you will do that. Again, remember that every person is a soul. And therefore, let us try to respect people. Let us try, even if you may not want to hug a, a, a paro, and I'm not saying because I may not do it either, but just respecting that person uh, is enough. Not spitting on the person or calling them scornful memes. That is enough. Let us remember that we are here just for a time. And 
at the end of the day, what legacy are we leaving behind? What lessons are we teaching our children? And what foundations are we setting on our properties? Thank you so much. It was my pleasure being with you this evening. Thank you so much, Carlton. Thank you so much. Um, you know, he, he, he did accept, you know, um, being on the program, but had a one or two of his concerns in terms of, you know, <laughs> being a little nervous. Imagine that, eh? But what a wonderful program with Carlton. Carlton, you're an awesome, amazing person. Um, after tonight's program, I'm, I'm, I'm even learning to appreciate you even more, you. you know, that I already appreciate yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I really want to wish you well, especially with this NGO. I hope that you get all the support that you need in bringing this to fruition, in bringing it to life, so that you can help those who need that kind yes. of help here in Dominica. So if there's any way anybody can assist you, there's any way I can assist you, you know, whether it be bringing you on the program to get you, bringing you back to talk about it, whatever the case might be, you know, I'll be more than happy to assist. Thank you to the listeners of the program. Your listenership is what has us here every Monday night. Uh, those of you who view the program and your interaction on the social media platforms, thank you so much. I appreciate and love each and every one of you. And always those who meet me in town or anywhere and say, I listen to you on a Monday night and I just smile and I say thank you so much. Please continue to support me and the program. And supporting me in this case is simply just listening. Listening and participating wherever you can participate. Next week, Monday, we'll have the Honorable Ron Green uh, will be in the spotlight. Uh, so look out for that next week, Monday. And the following Monday, the interim leader of the Dominica Freedom Party will also be here. That's it on the In The Spotlight radio show for tonight. Thank you again, Carlton Lando, and thank you to everyone who tuned in and listened to the program. Until next time, have a good night, everyone. The people asking for part two. Well, bring me back. You're listening to In The Spotlight. Yes. Yes. Good luck to hear from you. Those fans of mine, they always want a part two. Or you always want a part two. Bye-bye. Good night.